you're listening to Barbell Logic, brought to you by Barbell Logic Online Coaching, where each week we take a systematic walk through strength training and the refining power of voluntary hardship. This is the Barbell Logic Podcast. I'm Scott. That's Matt. As you know, today we want to talk about what you need to be doing if you just signed up for your first meet. So you went to the internet and you went to USS. Yeah, print print it out. Str- right. Fill it out. Put it in an envelope. Put mail a stamp check on in. it. <laughs> mail your, the way we used to do it back in the olden days. You filled it out on usstrengthlifting.com. You sent in the money or USAPL or whatever the heck it is. And you've got your first meet coming up. Yep. So what's that guy or gal need to start doing? Yeah, so we have to know first off how far out it's the meet. So let's pretend it's three months out. That's Perfect. probably pretty standard. If you're doing LP, you just keep doing LP. Right. For a long time, for as long as you can. And when you get down to the last month of LP, if LP is the thing that you are on, you're just going to keep running LP. There's a really good argument to be made for that, right? Like, you're not going to change the world at that meet. Yep. So, you know, just go ahead and make your progress. You're going to get a little bit of rest at the end of the week. You're in LP. You're going to hit your singles. They're all going to be PRs. Yeah, sure. Like your opener is probably going to be a PR. Sure. So that's a perfectly good way to go yeah, about I it. Yeah, I think from a theoretical standpoint, the most important thing to understand when you sign up for your first meet is this. And if you hear nothing else the entire episode is this. No one cares who wins. Right. No one cares. No one cares who wins a powerlifting meet because you're not really competing against anybody else. You're just setting PRs in front of judges and in front of a crowd, which makes it more fun. And there's this competitive excitement. But if somebody shows up that's stronger than you, they're going to win. Everybody that signs up for their first meet is like, man, do you think I can place? Oh, you're confused thinking that I or anyone else cares. Your mom doesn't care if you win. Right. Nobody cares. And it's not because we don't care about you. It's that that's not the nature of the sport. The sport's about PRs. Any normal person that enters a meet, just some dude or some lady, like none of their friends do this stuff. Like everybody is going to be amazed just by the fact that you even do it. Yeah. Hey, what are you doing next week? Oh man, I can't go out to dinner because I've got this meet. What? Yeah, we talk about <laughs> yeah. voluntary hardship a lot. It's like, man, most people aren't ballsy enough to sign up for a powerlifting meet. Right. Or anything that's competitive, right? Most of them aren't ballsy enough to sign up for a mud run on a Saturday. Right. And I think that's actually less ballsy, but most people will never do those things. And so, you know, it definitely makes a statement about who you are, that you're willing to go put it on the line in front of everybody else and have your lifts judged by solid judges and perform under those sort of competitive specifications and try to hit PRs. But let's be clear the goal at a meet is to hit PRs. That's it. Not to make weight. That's crazy. Yeah, we're talking about somebody that's, this is their first meet. We're not worried about By the way, weight. I'm talking about the person who is their second meet or third meet or fifth meet or 10th meet. Right. The people that need to cut weight and or win meets are world level right. lifters right. who are probably not listening to this podcast. And if you are, we'd love to interview you on a Friday. <laughs> right. Well, I would like to call a little bit of bullshit on you because I did see you and my wife pull a collective like 48 pounds yeah. <laughs> for a meet at Wichita Falls a couple Which, years Which, by ago. the way, we were both in the running for the overall. And there was some money on the line, I think, or a free barbell at that time or something like, okay, so when prizes come in, like legit prizes, not like a medal or a trophy that your wife is not going to let you put on your fireplace mantle, right? My wife will put her trophies. (laughs) Yeah, your wife would. (laughs) Uh, All my trophies, pretty much every trophy I've ever won is probably not still, but when I sold Strong Gym, it's still sitting on top of a closet in the powerlifting room in Strong Gym. I took none of them. I didn't care, Right. right? I've got a couple, you know, when I won my pro card, I got a cool ax. I still have that. But other than that, man, nobody cares. And so we go to set PR. So the first thing is the mindset. Focus on the mindset first. Mindset is I'm going to set PRs. I'm not going to make weight, cut weight, anything like that. Or is it for the first meet? Is it actually go nine for nine? Yeah, which should be PRs. I mean, if you go nine for nine, like, you know, I think we'd have to talk if you want to go nine for nine and you go three for three on all three lifts and don't set any PRs, that'd be kind of weird. But yes, of course, the idea is a successful day. You don't want to miss any attempts and you want to walk away with PRs. They don't even have to be giant PRs, just PRs, solid lifts. Like that's the goal. So back to our guy in LP, you know, your Monday before the meet, you're going to do an LP, a yep. regular LP session, maybe even the Wednesday before, depending on how late in LP. Sure. Of course. Maybe I would agree, but 
I think actually our approach would be to start tapering those people's volume and driving their intensity up more, maybe four weeks out. In the beginning, I don't think I'd taper their volume. I would just change them from three sets of five to five sets of three. Right. I'd move them to right. triples instead of fives. So the same volume, they're still in 15 reps, five sets of three. Three weeks out, I'd probably take them to three sets of three. Two weeks out, I'd probably go two sets of two or three sets of two or top set of two with a couple back off sets of two, anything like that. Just heavy doubles, right? And then the Friday that is eight days out. Two Fridays from the meet. Two Fridays from the meet, right? I'd hit singles. Right. And I hit singles again on Monday. On that Friday, I would work up to a heavy single, one that is a decent grind, but not a miss. Mm -hmm. We're taking the number of reps in a set down. Correct. So our sets are going from fives to threes to maybe Two doubles to singles. and maybe double yep. or singles. Are you going to drive the weight increases up more than five pounds? Of course. Right. You're going to have to. So this is where, you know, for purposes of the podcast, I wouldn't program this as RPE to my client, but because most people understand what RPE is at this point. Yeah, you're talking about if you go from five sets of three to three sets of three to three sets of two or two sets of two to singles, how do you know how much to jump? And the reality is you don't. But you can so, jump more than five. But you can jump more than five. And so what I would do is I would just take relatively small jumps. I would, you know, if you're squatting somewhere in the 300s, what I would do is when I got to about 260, I would probably make 20 pound jumps for singles. I'd hit like 260 for a single, 280 for a single. Okay, that's pretty easy. 300 for a single. Okay, that's actually pretty easy. Maybe a 15 pound. Let's go 315 for a single. All right, that's getting pretty hard. But I got another one. I mean, 325, 10 pound jump for a right. single. All right, that's a pretty good grind. Stop. Done. Right. So I ended up doing five singles, four or five singles on that Friday, eight days out. Got used to singles, made sure my form was fine. Come back Monday. I'm going to do it again, similar sort of thing. If I feel good, I can go up a little heavier than 325. If, you know, as I get up to 315, if it grinds, I can stop at 315. On Wednesday, I'm going to work up to a single that's about 8% less than I did on Monday. Yeah, so if and, you just 315, you're going to have a guy do like, I don't know, 295 on yep, Wednesday and, and you shut do it that down. And shut it down, and that'll be your opener. Your opener should be a weight that you can hit for a triple on your worst day. As a beginner, right? Not as somebody who squats 600 pounds. This is our first meet. This is our first meet. So, you know, if you're going to end up squatting, you've got the potential for squatting 350 at a meet. Your opener should probably be about 285, 290, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe 300. And then 325 and then 350, somewhere from there, right? If you're a female and you're squatting, say you're going to squat 200 pounds, you're probably going to squat like 170 so I was going to say 170, then 185, 200, right? 10, 15 pound jumps on these things would now, be just fine. We're starting pretty conservative, right? right? And you got to be smart if a female grinds a little bit on her second and her form is good. Right? She doesn't grind because her form, because the bar gets forward and then foot or something. You don't have much more to jump. So I'm always watching. You and I work together at meets all the time. And we usually don't stand next to each other yeah. while the lifter's on the platform because I don't want to be influenced by how much you think the weight should go up and vice versa. And so we're watching and you watch the lifter on their second attempt and I'm watching and I think, okay, five kilo jump. And I look at you and I hold up the number five of my hand. And I'm holding up three. And you're holding up, yeah. <laughs> and, or you're holding up six. Right. Right. Or actually 80% of the time you're holding up the same number I am. And so if it's the same number, we don't even have to deliberate. Just go tell them, put it on the card, and let's go up five kilos. If we disagree, we'll come back a little bit and talk and usually meet in the middle. You said three kilos. I said five. Sometimes you've got math worked out, and you'll say, well, three kilos gets them a PR. And I think they can probably do five kilos as well. And then I'll go, ah, well, let's go four kilos. And, you know, we can kind of adjust there. But in general, small, simple jumps. What I would do on your first meet is I would hit PRs on your thirds. Right. Yep. I would not hit PRs on your second. Yeah. I wrapped up around a round of block training. This isn't a meet, but this applies, I think. Yep. So your first meet, you want to just get that PR. Well, I had a deadlift goal in mind, and I went for it and missed it. Yep. Because I didn't want my PR. <laughs> I wanted that goal. Sure. And, you know, so that happens later in the game. You yeah, it's totally that. fine. But like you tell a story about you wanted 700 yep. in a meet, and you just, I mean, you went for it. And if you'd missed it, <laughs> You know, it was coming only for a 700 pound deadlift. You didn't care about anything else. So I opened at 700. That's right. 
I just coached Michael Cordova in uh, San Francisco. And I want to be careful the way I word this. Cordova had strained a glute really bad, like right at the ischial tuberosity, about five weeks out from the meet. We never said a word about it. He never, other than to me, we tried to rehab it as best we could because he's a guy that doesn't want to make excuses. And so I want to be real careful about, don't want to make that an excuse. But he squatted 660 on his third and got called on depth yeah. red lights. It was really, really close to see the video. It was a good call. It's fine. Fast. He, he's fast. He squatted two parallel, 660 to parallel for sure. But it was very borderline on whether it was below parallel. And you got to squat below parallel. Yep. So he got two reds and one white and was a little bit not happy about that. Not angry at the judges, but not happy that he didn't end up with his sure. high squat. Right. Had a solid day pressing. No problem. Got to the deadlifts. And his main competition for the win was Jordan Feigenbaum, who had put on a really good day so far. And we had done the math based on the coefficients, and Jordan pulled his first deadlift, which I think was, what, I think about 620-ish or somewhere in there. Stupid metrics. I have um, yeah, because it was kilos. I knew when Jordan pulled his first, he had won the meet. He had won the overall. Couldn't catch him. Couldn't catch him. And so Cordova took his opener, which was somewhere in the ballpark of, in the same kind of ballpark as Jordan's. So it was 620, 625, 630, somewhere in there. So I took Cordova aside in the back room and I said, you can't win. What do we have to do to make it a good meet? He said, I want a 705 deadlift. Right. I said, okay, we're going to 705. There you go. Actually, I think he pulled 650 for his opener because it wasn't that big of a jump. Yeah, it was like 650, 685, yeah. and then like 704. That's what he was going to do, but he didn't do But then we chose not to do the 685. We went right from 650 to 705. Now, everybody was like, wow, why would he go up that much? Well, okay, here's why. That guy is a super advanced lifter who's done lots of meets, right? right? The thing that would put the cap on the meet to make it a successful day for him was a 705 deadlift. If he goes out and he pulls 685 and then he misses 705 on his third, it's still not... He's not, not interested in 685. Still, it's a waste. It's a waste yeah. of an attempt. Now, if 685 gets him the win for the overall, which is the only meet that matters, it's a nationals, right? right. Otherwise... Nobody even cares for the big guys. You're just going to hit PRs. You're not even going to win. It doesn't matter, right? So unless there's money on the line or something. So this is a big national meet. So if he could pull 685 and won, then it would have made sense to pull 685. Right. But now he can't win. He's got a callus tearing open on his left hand ring finger. Kind of starting to tear bad. So it's one of those ones that's like a deep crack, like you know when you get real dry skin and a deep crack. I'm going, mm, I'm going to call 685 and he's going to pull that thing and he's going to pull it just fine. That callus is going to open. He's going to wear out his back. He's going to go 705 and 705 is going to miss. So it's 705 and he pulled it to half, one half inch from lockout. Yeah, he couldn't <laughs> quite get the shoulders back. Which is fine. And so yeah. then, you know, later they kind of question, well, why did you guys go up that? Well, that's why, right? But here's the difference. That guy can go one for three or two for three on deadlift and walk away and go like, that was a still a really good day. Yep. Your first meet, that's not the case. You need to leave a meat with a wonderful taste in your mouth for this sport. Yeah, where you walk away, and you're just like, man, the people are really cool. Everybody's really encouraging. Even my And they are. They are encouraging. That's exactly right. Even the people that were in my weight class that I was quote unquote competing with cheered me on. The meat was smooth. It didn't take nine hours. Like all those things. Like, and oh, by the way, I went nine for nine. I fought some demons while I was up there on the platform. I learned some stuff about myself. I got to grind on some singles I'm not used to. That's the goal, right? And so you're going to go in there and just do the best you can, come away with a solid day. So let's talk about training. I've got a few little things that the new guy might not think of. When you squat, well, when you squat, you press and you deadlift, you're going to be facing these people. Yep. Most of the time when we train, we're facing in at the wall. Yep. You know, so I want you guys to, uh, well, if you can, I want you to squat out of squat stands facing out. And if there's yep. no stands in your gym and you're in your rack, I want you to turn those hooks around and I want you to face out. It's different. It's different. It makes a difference. Yep. So I want you to start squatting facing out. I want you to press facing out. I want you to deadlift facing out. There are going to be people walking around in front of you in a public gym and uh, some guy is going to be doing BOSU ball punches over in the corner and it's all distracting and that makes a difference. So get, yep. let's get a little practice doing that. And you should use your gear. If you're going to be in a singlet, then I want you wearing your singlet at least that last week. Yep, I agree. Maybe longer. Yeah, maybe especially a couple for weeks. the squat and deadlift. The squat, the bar feels different on your back if all you've ever worn is a cotton t shirt right. and now you've got that shimmery <laughs> nylon <laughs> glamorous cat singlet, you know, with a big picture of your kitty cat's face on the front. Right. Yeah, it just feels different. Things pulling down on your traps. 
Hell, you um, might find out it doesn't quite fit right, right? I mean, you know, you don't know. Yeah, it's probably so, too big. Yeah. You should go down and get an extra small because the smaller singlet you wear, the more tightness you get at the bottom of the hole. I'm going to risk a blowout on a singlet. Uh-huh. I don't mind. Like today. <laughs> like there's no rules about blowing the ass of your singlet out. Right. I'm going to turn that into a squat suit. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, no. Yeah. Just error on the side is slightly too small in the squat suit or on the singlet. And then on the deadlift causes some issues sometimes on the bar dragging up your leg. And so if you're used to wearing, especially if you're used to wearing like Under Armour compression shorts, and then you have a slick pair of basketball shorts or workout shorts or Lulu shorts or something like that, and that bar grabs those shorts, and those shorts just slide up your Under Armour shorts or your boxer briefs or anything like that that you're wearing. And now you don't have that, and you've got these singlet. Sausage casings and you've on. Got, yeah, and you've got your bare legs sticking out, which in strength lifting, you're not allowed to use baby powder or you're not allowed to use oil anywhere. But in a lot of places you can use baby powder. It kind of helps reduce friction. It's the opposite of chalk. you got to get used to dragging heavy deadlifts up your bare thighs. Right. So it is certainly something there's nothing wrong with training in a singlet, especially the last couple of weeks. I know we've all had, you and I both have had clients that train in their singlet every single time. I'm looking at you, Tim Roberts. That's right. It's, uh, which is fine. It's a little goofy. And just assume they're going to go to a wrestling match afterwards. Do some Greco-Roman hot-oiled wrestling. I'm always up for that. I train at home. <laughs> yeah. It's funny, the, how do I say the last name? The Barrera? Barrera. They're, the, they're like the Greco national champions for Canada. Philip and Thomas, they don't, in fact, squat in their singlets. Thomas came and trained with us from Canada. He yeah. ended up in Catoosa, Oklahoma, and then he drove into town into Tulsa and trained with me. One of the nicest guys I've super ever met. Super good guys. Just super big fan of him, and I want him on the show. Yeah. So, Real uh, intelligent guys, super conscientious sort of guys, and strong. Athlete philosopher. He's just a hell of a yeah. guy. Man. Yeah. Yeah. Well spoken. So, yeah. So, Basically, what you're going to do on your training is you're going to go from fives to threes to twos to ones. You're going to hit singles for a week or two out from your meet. Everything else is going to stay the same. The one thing I would change is I would drop the lift that you're not going to do the last 10 days or so. Yeah. So if you're going to do a powerlifting meet and you're going to bench, then I would replace the presses with bench. I'd probably bench three times a week. Maybe you go yeah. heavy, light, heavy or whatever. If press is the same thing, I would get rid of the bench press and uh, just gives you a little extra practice on that specific lift. And of course, everybody's going to squat and deadlift. So you continue those the way you, you normally would. Ready to go. If you're going to be competing in a federation that does something different than our form, like a sumo deadlift, for example, well, what are we going to do? Well, I say does a sumo deadlift. That's not true, right? There are federations that allow it, but they don't specify that you must sumo sure. deadlift. No, that's a good question. So I, I know where you're getting at. So if you're somebody that's just doing LP, I think that you go out there and you do a conventional deadlift and you set a conventional deadlift PR on your first session. Two, three meets from now when you're out of LP and your situation has changed, we may consider pulling sumo for the meet at yeah, that point. Probably not. Still, yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, again, at the point that you're potentially winning national level meets, you're a national level lifter, if your leverages are such that you can pull sumo and you can win some kind of big time meets, then look, man, it's in the rule, do it, right? The point is this, for your first meet, by the way, I don't think you can do better than a strength lifting meet for your first meet. I think yeah. they're awesome. So I just think that they're really well run meets. They're short. They don't last forever. Sometimes meets last really, really long, and they yep. suck for your wife and your kids and your mom and dad who come and watch it. Strength lifting meets hard to beat. However, I don't think you should care about the federation for the first. If you've got a meet in a federation that's notorious for allowing high squats and things like that, and it's in your backyard, do it. Who cares? Yeah, squat below parallel. It doesn't do the right, right thing. That's exactly right. right. It doesn't mean that you have to squat above that's parallel. Right. You hold yourself to the standard. You video yourself. When you watch those videos, you go look. If it's not up to a standard, if it would not have passed in a strength lifting meet or a USAPL meet or an IPF meet or a USPA meet, pretty solid federations, then you say, it's no good. I'm not going to post it online. Right. That's the deal. Like, right. you don't get to post stuff on Instagram that are crappy. <laughs> That's the deal. Right. You squat below parallel, then you can post it. That's why everybody's always like, how come all you ever do is post videos of your press and your bench press and your deadlifts and you never post videos of your squat because my squat sucks <laughs> right. i don't post videos of my squat that's the same thing i say <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. it's part of the deal and so shoes you know it's the same deal right yeah we can reduce our range of motion and you know kind of manipulate the lift when we do our sumo deadlift we can reduce the range of motion when we kick our shoes off too sure. you know in the deadlift and so 
if you're a guy that's in LP and you're going to your first meet, you're going to have to make a decision. Am I going to pull in deadlift slippers or am I going to pull in shoes? Yep. I don't think there's a wrong answer. No, I'd have them pull in shoes. I'd have them pull in shoes. It's your first meet. You're not going to crush the world. Nope. If you're way late in LP and you're a dude and you've pulled 475 and you think you could get a 500, that's a significant milestone. Sure. You might I'd take your shoes off for you might kick la- it off. that last week of singles if I did that just to get yep. used to it. Because you've got an important goal you're shooting for sure. in, in your grasp. So at that point, you might kick them off. But if you don't have a specific goal in mind like that, I think you just wear them. I think you wear them and you pull. Maybe you could have got more on the bar if you didn't, but we don't care. Yeah. Uh, and maybe not, by the way. Like if you're used to pulling in shoes, your shoes allow you to initiate the movement with the quads better than if you don't have the shoes. The trade-off is it's a little longer range of motion. But uh, yeah, just I'm of the opinion that if this podcast is about preparing for your first meet, mm-hmm. then in the same way we preach minimum effective dose, I would change the least amount of stuff. Right. There is for sure an upcoming episode down the pipeline of the little tweaks that we make for uber competitive lifters, right? right? There's lots of little tweaks that I make for, when you squat five or 600 pounds and you deadlift six or 700 pounds and you bench press four or 500 pounds, of course there's little tweaks we make. Like we talk, you know, we've been talking about the Olympic press and we talk about why do power lifters take an ultra wide grip bench press and touch low and throw high and have a big arch and when might I wanna widen my stance a little bit on squats and things like all those things are potential or when would I sumo deadlift? Like those sorts of things. You might potentially do that down the road. Yep. I just wouldn't do any of it for your first meet. Right. I would make your first meet as close to normal as you possibly can. And then on the day of the meet, you're going to try to picture your lifts and the setup at the meet like you're standing in your garage or in your basement. You're going to make it as normal as you possibly can so that when you take the bar out of the rack, you're going to try to put all the people out of your eyesight and out of your head there's usually not any music playing. I, there is in, in certain powerlifting federations, which, by the way, I don't have any problem with. Yeah, I don't either. Um, I used to. Back when I used to learn about, like, USA weightlifting meets and they don't have music, I was like, God, how could anybody do that? And then I realized, like, whoa, am I externally motivated by mm. listening to Metallica mm. or something? Like, I don't know. There was no music at uh, USSF National Center, was there? No, yeah. no. As yeah. a matter of fact, some, there was some story behind that I'm trying to remember. Some guy, I think a competitor. It should have been Christ and Knife, like and, the soundtrack. Yeah, of the- yeah. <laughs> Chris Knife. Chris Knife, I don't know. Yeah, whatever. Chris's Knife. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think somebody walked up to Tom and was like, uh, well, you don't have some music? And Tom was like, uh, no. Right. <laughs> so do you need that? That's earphones, man. Yeah, the point here is when you're prepping for your first meet, change as little as you can about your training. You don't get judged on doing your best set of five. You get judged on doing your best single. So probably everybody needs to taper a little bit from fives to threes to ones. Whether you do that over the course of a week or two weeks or a month is kind of depending on how far down the line in LP you are. Or male or female. Uh, Or male or female. Yep. I change very little about your equipment. The equipment that you train in is equipment that I would lift in other than obviously you have to put a wrestling singlet on, which are super, super sexy and make everybody look incredible. Definitely Mm -hmm. not like a sack of potatoes or (laughs) they look fine. And then, yeah, I would just try to visualize the meat itself as I'm just at home doing another workout. Right. It is going to be a stress to you. Yeah. You are going to recover and adapt to that stress. And if you do it right, you actually come back a little bit stronger afterwards. You're going to feel, you know, tired and beat up and achy and sore and all those sorts of things you're not used to feeling because you're not used to doing nine heavy singles in one day. And that's the way I would approach it. I would approach like, hey, I'm just going to go nine for nine and I'm going to set PRs and I'm going to make friends and have good experience yep. and let my mom and dad see what I've been doing all this crazy time or my wife or whoever. You know, usually make some connections. If you go to a meet that's in your area, you'll meet people that you might be able to train with on occasion in the area. And so that's what the first meet's for. Later down the road, we can talk about, I'm sure we will probably have a podcast on how to cut weight for a powerlifting meet (laughs) two years down the road. Right. We're just not there yet. Right. The idea is like, look, we're still in this systematic progression of strength training. Right now we're in this position where we're kind of at the end of LP We're going into intermediate sort of programming. We've talked a little bit about intermediate stuff. We've talked a lot about novice. This is kind of the time when you should be looking at doing your first meet. Right. Not because you want to be a competitive powerlifter your whole life, but because it takes your lifting to the next level. When you pay for your entry fee and you know three months from now, I got to perform. And then you wake up one day and you got the sniffles and you wouldn't have worked out otherwise. You think, man, 
I got to train because people are going to watch me do this in another couple months. Do you know, I almost wrote, I wrote a check the other day and on the date, it was like January 10th, 1979. I wrote 19. I wrote one right, nine. Sure, of course. Like for 1990 something. Yeah. I was like, my God, it hasn't been 19 in 18 years. Yeah. I'm still writing 19s on personal checks. And then I thought to myself, why am I writing personal check? How many personal checks do you write every month? Less than five, right? Oh, certainly, yeah. Yeah, yeah. not very many. So I'm not going to say who I was writing that check to, but you guys know who it is, <laughs> right? They don't take automated payments. Right. So sometimes you got to write checks, man. That's the deal. Well, there is a little bit about what to do when you're prepping for your first meet. We've got another show that'll be coming up at some point about programming for the first meet, but it's more about what do you do that first day? So that one will be coming soon. Yeah. Meet day. So we've got how to prep for your first meet today. It'll be what does meet day actually look like? Right. What does actual meet day look like and how to eat and how to rest and like what to do and how to pick your attempts and things like that. I'm, I'll tackle both of those. I want to make one more run at clarifying all of this. This is for someone who's never been to a meet. Correct. And is trying to garner the experience. Correct. So we talked about what we do to prepare for that first meet. And it's those things are not 10% of what you will do to uh, prepare for your sixth or your eighth meet. Yep. We don't care about that right now. There will be a more complete show at some point where we may even do a case study with somebody like Cordova or Charity or somebody that's serious about it yep. and is going to have to pull out all the stops to put a kilo on their total. That's right. We'll talk about that one later. That ain't this show. But I hope you do enter a meet. Look at usstrengthlifting.com to find a meet near you. The nicest folks in the Barbell world run those meets. You can check us out. Follow us on Instagram at Barbell Logic. Thanks for listening.